Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here bright and early uh, on a Sunday morning. Really appreciate it, especially for an issue like the Cloud Act. I'm um, going to just say up front, this one is going to be a little bit complicated. E everything involving technology, and then when you add the application of law, it gets complicated quickly. But this one's complicated for a variety of reasons, um, in part because the problems the, bill tr uh, the law tries to solve are complicated, the way the law attempts to solve those problems is complicated, and the way that it was passed was complicated. Good morning. So, so <laughs> We are going to have fun this morning. Uh, we are going to take it step by step, and we're going to walk through the various components of this law and how it came to be, and what it's attempting to do, and what the future might hold. Um, but it's also going to be con conversational. That if we say something and it doesn't make sense, just pop your hand up. There's only a couple dozen of us. We'll we'll make sure that everybody gets through this. Uh, first of all, has anybody worked with the Cloud Act or have any familiarity with it or anything at all? Or we're starting pretty much from scratch. Just good. Good. I'm a little alarmed. Nobody on the panel raised their hands, so we, we, may, <laughs> we may have some troubles, but I think we're going to get through it. What are we here for? We're, we're talking about the Cloud Act. Are we, are we all in the right place? Okay. It's so like the cloud, like the internet, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. The, the Cloud Act is actually a combination of two different bills that were attempting to solve two different problems faced by law enforcement. So we're going to start by looking at what those problems that law enforcement claims that they have. Then we're going to talk about how the bill solves those problems. Then we're going to look at the bill a little bit to see does it solve the problems and does it create new problems. And then we can have a little discussion about whether or not we're actually addressing these issues or we need to do more or we need to push back. Uh, but before we do any of that, we're going to introduce ourselves so you know who we're, you're, you're, you're listening to. Uh, my name's Nathan. I work for an organization in, called Access Now. It's an international organization, but I work in Washington, D.C. I worked on the Hill for uh, five years. I was a political hack, we'll say, for five years, uh, and now I work in advocacy for an NGO. Uh, there is a very specific definition of a lobbyist that I do not fit. I am not a lobbyist, uh, but I do spend a fair amount of time talking to people around D.C. and politicians about technology and the law, uh, and this is one of those things that we've been working on for a long time uh, and did not expect it to be a law yet, so it's interesting to, uh, to have. want to just go I want to start with Kevin so it comes back down to me. Hi, uh, I'm Kevin Banks and I'm the director of the Open Technology Institute, which is a public interest nonprofit based in DC that works on uh, policy to ensure that all communities have access uh, to an internet that is both open and secure. My name is Amy Stepanovich. I work with Nathan at Access Now and manage our Washington DC office. Um, and work on the policy team as opposed to him working on the advocacy team. So we, we tag team a lot of different issues from different perspectives. My name is Cara Chapel. Okay. My name is Cara Chapel. Um, I am a senior litigation paralegal who has transitioned into the Freedom of Information Coordinator for the Department of Human Services in the city of Virginia Beach. I'm Jairus Khan. I, uh, I work with the Mozilla Foundation on Internet Health Issues. Um, I'm from Toronto, so I'll be playing the part of the concerned foreigner for this debate. Uh, so the, the issues that we're going to talk about are around technology and law enforcement. And technology has wildly changed how police operate. Uh, it used to be there was, we didn't carry around computers in our pockets. That if you wanted to find out what somebody was doing, you followed them around the city, or you got a wiretap and listened to their phone calls, or maybe they had recordings in their, on their home answering machine. The data was all very close to the people involved that you were uh, conducting surveillance on, or investigating, or perhaps the murder victim. Technology has wildly changed that. Uh, for a while, it meant that there was a massive amount of data available to law enforcement. And Kevin actually wrote a wonderful report called Tiny Constables that examined how the data that you carry around on your phone really made surveillance incredibly easy. You can turn on a microphone, you can record people, you can figure out where they're going, you can see where they've been for days and months at a time, and it's much, much cheaper. You don't have to pay a team of people to follow somebody around. You can just dump their phone and find out everywhere that they've been. 
It also makes things more difficult in that sometimes that data is more complicated. Sometimes that data is not on the phone. Sometimes that data is stored in the cloud. Sometimes that data is stored by a company. That makes it difficult for law enforcement who grew up in a world of, I'm going to go to the phone company and get a wiretap. It's more difficult if you say, I've got a phone. I don't even understand how this phone works. I don't know what data is on it. I don't know where to go get that data. So that has created a challenge for law enforcement that people around the world are facing with of just what to do with this explosion of data uh, and then how to get access to that data. That, da that issue is even massively further Furtherly, uh, I need more coffee. Uh, it's, that issue is further complicated by the fact that companies store data in different places around the world. If you are an American law enforcement officer, a lot of the data that is stored is stored by American companies, so it's easier for us. If you are not an American law enforcement officer, you frequently have to come to an American company or a foreign company to get information. So then you have the issue of time delays, different governments, different policies, different privacy responsibilities, and that's even if you know what data you're trying to get. So we've gotten to a place where the world of data is very, very complicated. Oh, and even if you are in the US and even if you have an American company, uh, American companies don't store data all in one place anymore. We have the cloud. We have uh, decentralized storage. Different cloud. Different cloud. Different cloud. <laughs> uh, so the, the data, even if it's an American company, and even if it's about American citizen, and even if you're American law enforcement, the data might exist somewhere else. So we've gotten to a world where lots and lots of data exists about us, but it exists in different places, and the access to get it for law enforcement has become increasingly complicated. And while many of us uh, are frequently oppositional to law enforcement in issues like encryption and security and cybersecurity. This is one of those issues where people can understand, yeah, this is becoming a difficult problem. We, we, we recognize that there might be a problem here and there might be ways that we can address this, but it's a very complicated issue that requires a lot of thought. And while we are all just saying, yeah, maybe we should think about this, uh, the Cloud Act passed and became law before anybody was really ready for it. So now we're in a position where we're examining the problems that exist, but also this rapid fire solution that has already become law before anybody really had time to think about it. So what we're gonna do today is go through some of those problems that people face, then go through the Cloud Act, and then discuss it. And to start with, uh, we're gonna start with something called the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty for Law Enforcement. Uh, and I'm just gonna kick it over to Kara, and if Kara, do you wanna introduce what that is, or? The MLATs. <laughs> well, um, I, I have to tell you, I, I would love to say that I'm as, as engaged and online with that. Um, the MLATs outlined to the extent which each country could share the data was stored within all of their borders. Um, each MLAT had to be ratified by a supermajority vote within the Senate and the act allowed the president to make executive agreements without congressional approval. In addition, requests from foreign governments uh, for data kept, the US, kept in the U.S. would only be required to follow the procedures of the requesting country, and U.S. due process protections will not be applied to each request for data. I think that is a very um, not helpful well, we, <laughs> explanation. We, we, we can unpack it. Um, yeah, if you would give me some assistance on that, because yeah. unfortunately I don't I can, have a great... Yeah. You, you want to unpack happy, that for us, Kevin? I'm happy to, yeah. Uh, so basically, MLATs are treaties between governments about whether and how law enforcement can get data between countries. And the way it would typically work, let's say, you know, between the U.S. and the U.K., is if the U.K. cop wanted information stored in the U.S., they would submit a request through basically their State Department, that would go to our State Department, that would go to our Justice Department, that would then review it and see whether it complied with U.S. law for making these requests, i.e. satisfied like um, the warrant requirement, if that was the relevant requirement for the type of data involved, then that would go to the company, the company would produce and it would be passed back along. This had the benefit of having a lot of checks and balances and making sure that foreign governments couldn't evade our strong legal protections. Uh, but it had the growing problem in the internet age of one, scaling. 
this is not a system that was good for internet scale. You know, it used to be actually fairly a rarity that a foreign government needed something from uh, a US company. Now it is routine and getting more and more routine and basically almost every criminal case starts to implicate somebody's email account or, or backup account or whatever uh, such that you have foreign authorities getting really frustrated by this process that takes a very long time and I think it's a feature, they think it's a bug, holds them to our really strong laws. When they're feeling like, hey, if I'm investigating a crime in my country of violating my laws, hurting my citizens, probably committed by one of my citizens, why am I having to jump through your legal hoops? And so that's the grand tension that sort of overhung this whole issue uh, as we went into the Cloud Act fight. And just to, the, so Kevin says feature and bug about the, the different legal standards. So most of the world, um, if they, if law enforcement wants access to data, they have to meet what's called the necessary and proportionate standard. That means that they have to show that the data is necessary to what they're doing and that it is a proportionate request, that they're not asking for information that's far exceeds what they're trying to get under that necessity prong. The U.S. is basically alone in using the probable cause standard that we have under the Fourth Amendment. So when most of law enforcement goes through their own domestic legal processes, they're very familiar with this necessary and proportionate standard. They know what they need to show. They know what evidence they need to put forward. They are not educated, at least they used to not be. Now they have to be um, to the extent that they use this process on how to satisfy the United States unique probable cause standard and that's created some tensions um, as they've had to go through more and more of these prolonged processes and come over and try to meet that standard in different cases. Um, so imagine for example um, a, a crime in a small village in the United Kingdom, um, somebody kills somebody else and they want that person's um, correspondence Law enforcement used to be able to go to their to the people they've been talking to, to their own filing cabinets. All that information existed in their home. It was really easy. It was just a pro it was a local crime with local process. Now, if they want to get their emails, those emails probably exist on Google or Yahoo or what are other email services? <laughs> AOL. Everybody uses Gmail. Um, and so they now have to come over to a United States company and get what they used to be able to get in local and go through this sometimes six months, sometimes 18 month um, process in order to get evidence they need for this hyper local crime where everybody would say law enforcement should be able to get information related to that. Like, this is not necessarily these things where we're objecting to the surveillance occurring um, some of the incidents that we're dealing with here are times when we really think that law enforcement should get access to the information they're getting access to. It's just taking them a long time. And then you throw in the fact that there are cases that we all know of where law enforcement abuses their power um, that's not different when you leave the United States um, and you want to make sure those checks and balances still occur. So how do you facilitate the information getting to law enforcement when they need it without taking away the checks and balances that you need to keep them from abusing their authority. That's not the standard that most, I mean, in the not even just the EU, Repeat most the standard question. countries in the world, oh, sorry. He asked if the probable cause standard doesn't constrain the EU. Um, and most countries in the world don't use that standard. The EU, South America, Southeast Asia, Australia, like they mostly use this necessary and proportionate standard, which is, the standard recognized under human rights law um, as the appropriate standard to use to get information. The U.S. kind of stands alone. We came up with our own standard. So complicated already, and that's just the first step. Uh, one more thing to add on, on MLATs. Uh, as mentioned, they are bilateral, which means it's between two countries. That means, let's say, you're in Switzerland. Most of the data you're going to want is in American companies, but there are other tech companies in the world. So that means you also need to know, is this data held by an American company, a British company, a French company, and what are the standards that I have to go through for that? I'd also like to add, I did not fact check this, but I seem to recall pretty much the minimum amount of time to get information back on an MLAT request is about six months. 
So not an ideal system. These are the problems that exist for law enforcement in places outside the United States, but law enforcement in the United States also has problems with data that's stored around the world. And that comes from a very famous case, I, actually famous among us, but probably not famous, <laughs> famous among to the nerds <laughs> like us. <laughs> famous. Uh, a, a case called US v. Microsoft. And for that, I'm going to kick it to Jairus. Can you tell us about US v. Microsoft? I would love to. Um, so uh, 2013, um, the, uh, the US uh, government goes to Microsoft and says, OK, we've got a, a drug trafficking case. Um, we need to get some emails. Uh, from this one email account, um, and uh, and we have a warrant under the the Stored Communications Act, which is uh, from 1983 or something like that. It was um, not really written with you know the cloud in mind. It, it was kind of data existed kind of in one place, and, and and that was fine. So Microsoft comes back and says, okay, well the metadata for the emails we have it for you because um, it's stored on our servers, but the actual emails themselves are stored in Ireland uh, because the account. Uh, is an Irish Hotmail account. Um, is the person actually Irish? Who knows? Mysteries. But they signed up and said they were Irish. They said, you know, so it, it goes to the Irish server. Um, the, uh, the, uh, so they resist the warrant. They go to court. Um, the court rules in favor of the government um, and says that the, uh, the SCA is not subject to territorial limitations. It doesn't specify in it that it's U.S. only. What is the SCA? So that's the that's the Stored Communications Act uh, from before, which which gives them the power to warrant uh, this information from Microsoft in the first place. Microsoft appeals again; uh, they uh, they lose again. Uh, they appeal to the second district court, um, and this is the point at which um, a lot of other companies start filing uh, briefs to the uh, to the court to kind of. Give their uh, give their info on it. Um, the uh, the government of Ireland at this point actually files a brief saying, um, so we actually think that the 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 process that the U.S. government is requesting this data under violates European law and Irish law, and also we have an MLAT with the United States, and they haven't asked us for it. So if they wanted to ask us for the data, we could help them with that. But we're just kind of pointing out it hasn't. Uh, if no they use the MLAT. If they use the MLAT, yeah. Um, but noting, kind of pointedly, that the MLAT has not been uh, has not been invoked in this case, um, uh, the uh, the court rules for micro or for Microsoft. Um, the Department of Justice appeals to the Supreme Court, um, and while that is all happening at the Supreme Court, um, the Cloud Act gets passed, uh, and everyone agrees that the case is moot. Um, a thing that I think is interesting about the about the um, the ruling. Uh, at the second district that found from Microsoft is uh, the ruling relied uh, on a, a Supreme Court ruling uh, that says, quote, the longstanding principle of American law that legislation of Congress, unless a contrary intent appears, is meant only to apply within the territorial jurisdiction of the United States. And that was what kind of tilted it for Microsoft at the, uh, at the last appeal there. The idea that, you know, it, if it doesn't say this applies outside of the U.S., it doesn't pl apply outside of the U.S. So that was kind of the what was happening at the time that the, uh, the Cloud Act got passed. And so we've been calling it the Cloud Act. Now we've finally gotten to the point where it makes sense to explain what the Cloud Act stands for. Can I, beforehand, can I pull the audience on something real quick? Sure. Are you bored yet? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, so pre-Cloud Act, there were a lot of questions about if we were to try to fix this MLAP problem, what should the solution be? Um, so you have a person, a human being, whose law enforcement is trying to seek data from them. You have the data itself, and you have the law enforcement entity. And they all could be located in three different countries. You could live somewhere, the data could live somewhere, the law enforcement entity could live somewhere. And so I've, we had a lot of conversations, I think a lot of people working on this issue, of where should the jurisdiction attach? What law should law enforcement have to use in order to get access to that data? Um, and there are pros and cons with every approach. So I'm curious, and I'm putting you on the spot, and it's really early in the morning, and I'm not going to hold you to this, and none of you are on camera, I don't think. Um, so just like your instinct should the um, the law that should be used be where the data is stored. Raise your hand. If 
Should it be where the person lives? Should it be where the law enforcement entity is? Do you just not care because it's too early in the morning? That's fine. <laughs> oh, did, did you? Yeah. That's one of the pros and cons. The sharding of data was a very problematic, yeah, problematic issue here. Um, I didn't talk about the company because it's so you could say where the company is headquartered. You could say where the company does business. I went with the, where the company stores the data, just to simplify. There are even within like just the, if you focus on the company, you then have like six different options to go with, it, just for the company. Um, and then when the company stores data in 10 different places all at once, it gets even more. Com so these are the questions policymakers were trying to answer when the Cloud Act got passed. So the, the comment was somebody suggested that it's uh, jurisdiction attached where the crime occurred. Alleged crime. crime. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're, we're where does an internet crime occur, though? It's not always an internet crime. Though. No, no, it isn't. But that there's a. Well, we've thoroughly established this is complicated, right? <laughs> <I> <laughs> it, even among those of us who have been talking about this for years, we're at the point of like, yeah, this is complicated. We should probably have this conversation. Um, before we move on to the next topic, I want to I want to actually segue a little bit of a, bear, a bit of a parenthetical because there's another big issue that we frequently talk about that is implicated by this bill, and that is encryption. And we had a specific panel on encryption yesterday. We're not gonna get into a lot of the details about encryption. But one of the things that we found is that generally law enforcement around the world in the United States and in many other countries does face problems with data in that they call it going dark. And they worry that all the data on your phone, all the data that they want is gonna be encrypted. And even with all the proper uh, warrants and all the proper legal standards, they'll never get the data anyway and this is such a big disaster. When you dig in and you talk with people, you, you, you really frequently find out that is kind of the banner issue that they say when they really mean data is complicated and it's really hard. Uh, there's a case, I'm not going to say famous again, but I think it's fascinating, out of Australia. Uh, where a mother brought in her daughter's phone and showed the Instagram account where her 13-year-old daughter was getting death threats through Instagram. And uh, the local equivalent of a sheriff said, that's an American company, what do you want us to do? There's, there's nothing we can do about that, go home. And she was, of course, appalled that her young daughter is getting death threats through this, this, this uh, platform. Uh, Instagram, through their trade association, actually found out about this story, and they were appalled, and they said, no, 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 no. In Australia, you don't even need a warrant for something like this. Just show us that you're getting the death threat, and we will give you, uh, without a warrant, just show us what it is, and we'll give you the, the metadata that shows exactly who sent that when and where. We, we could definitely have given you that information. So it was, a, you know, I have no idea how serious, but a death threat that wasn't even investigated that could have been resolved fairly quickly but a lack of knowledge for what data exists, how to get the data, what the process is for the data. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the history of encryption and how this Im Im implies, but we're not gonna get super deep into encryption unless Amy tells us she wants to get super deep into encryption. So Amy, can you give us a top line summary of the like crypto wars and how uh, the need for data is impacting law enforcement around the world? I mean, I think Nathan, ex I will not go deep into this. I think Nathan explained it pretty well. It's, an, it's a matter of there are a lot of barriers that law enforcement faces to get data. And right now the issue of encryption is really what, what would be called sexy in headlines. If law enforcement says we can't get data because it's encrypted, um, that is the issue du jour in the tech policy world. And it's really easy to get um, those, those necessary um, headline inches, if you use those words. Um, it also is a big issue where um, governments are trying to pass laws locally. So if they bring in an issue where they're trying to pass a law and blame the inability to investigate a case on that issue, they are more likely to have the evidence and have the support they need to pass the law they're trying to go to. We've seen this in the US frequently. Um, how many times have we seen laws justified 
um, because of terrorism or because of general crime or because of other issues that are, are potentially tangential to what the law is trying to accomplish, but they, they provide the support needed to pass the bill. Um, so encryption is one of those issues um, that we hear come up quite frequently in areas where encryption is not a problem. Another story out of Brazil, um, there, there are horrible people on the internet. Do we all know there are horrible people on the internet? Um, and I was speaking with a law enforcement officer in Brazil, and he um, told me because of encryption, he was not able to get access to the location information of pedophiles using Facebook to distribute horrible videos of what they were doing to children, um, which is something I think we can all say, like, we want law enforcement to investigate crimes related to horrible things that people do to children. Except what he was looking at, first of all, was coming through Facebook Messenger. Is anybody under the impression that Facebook Messenger is end-to-end -end encrypted? It's not. Um, he was also looking for location information, which is metadata, which is not encrypted even when messaging services content is end-to-end. -end. So it was, this wasn't an encryption issue at all. What he was having is a issue of trying to get access to certain types of data. And actually, because it was um, metadata, it wasn't really an MLAT issue either. Um, but they're, again, they're, they're flagging this to encryption, which isn't an issue with the data they're frequently trying to get access to. Uh, data retention is another thing that they're trying to do. Um, so it's not only that they're trying to get encryption laws, they're trying to say companies are not keeping the data, it doesn't exist. Um, so they're trying to pass data retention laws, mandatory data retention. Companies have to keep certain types of data for so long. Um, or in our country, so it's easier to get. data localization laws, you have to keep the data in our country, or you have to have employees stationed in our countries. These are things that um, companies are doing to try to end run around a long, difficult, arduous MLAT process um, that are having um, significantly bigger um, impacts on the world than what would happen if we just tried to solve the specific problem um, that they really have. Um, so it's just, it's a matter of, and Nathan has used the word complicated, it's, it's mostly because it's a really appropriate word to use here, and law enforcement doesn't make it easier on themselves by confusing issues that really should be put in their own separate boxes um, and discussed separately into one area where they think if they just throw the kitchen sink at the wall, something is going to stick and they're going to be able um, to be more successful in what they want than they are right now. Um, but that that's about so that's the world in which we live. Data exists around the world. Crimes are committed around the world. Law enforcement exists around the world. And there is lots of complicated interactions between the two, or between the three, between who, who, all the things. Uh, so the Cloud Act is something that was originally suggested by the DOJ in an agreement with the United Kingdom to try to just not even resolve all these issues to get around them. And we're finally going to start talking about what this uh, I would like to call it proposed solution is, but it was rushed into law, so it is actually uh, now law, uh, for good or bad. And what it actually stands for is Clarifying Lawful Overseas Use of Data Act. I'm going to say that again because it's, well, it's long. Clarifying Lawful Overseas Use of Data Act, which hopefully after the last 30 minutes at least makes sense for what this bill is trying to address. And to talk about what the bill actually, law, Hate saying that law actually does. Kevin is going to walk us through what it does. Sure. Um, before I do that, though, I'm going to talk a little bit about where all the players were on the board and what their incentives were that led us to having this law passed with the content that it had and the way that it did. So we basically talked about two issues. There is the inside out issue of US needing data U.S. law enforcement needing data from outside the U.S., like in the Microsoft Ireland case. And then there's the issue of uh, outside in, the foreign governments needing data from inside the U.S. And there are these two big issues that need to be resolved that are that are so fun. Um, sorry, that's what they're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and so you had these two big issues with, uh, and so let's take, let's take um, inside out Microsoft Ireland first. Um, you had this case going to the Supreme Court. 
uh, and you had the government saying, this law lets us get the data outside of the US no matter what, it just applies extraterritorially, and Microsoft saying, no, it doesn't. And Microsoft had an edge on the law because the basic standard is if it doesn't say it applies extraterritorially, it doesn't. Although DOJ had the edge on policy because they could say, look, this is a crazy reading of the law because if, if this is the law, then someone can merely store data outside of the US and we're just screwed. Like anyone can evade us easily all the time if this is the law, that's a bad result. And so there was an expectation that maybe DOJ wins the case and they continue as they always have to just serve their, their things and get their data, or they lose and they have to go to Congress and try and get a law passed, which they probably would have been able to do, that basically just added one sentence to the law that said, this applies extraterritorially. Um, but if they could get around that and avoid a loss and come up with a deal before that happened, that would be good for them. Um, meanwhile, the companies also knew that, that a result where if we happen to store the data outside the country, US law enforcement is screwed is a bad result. They were just trying to use this fight as leverage to drive that legislative conversation about what the right balance should be. Meanwhile, you have privacy groups like us in the mix trying to be a part of that conversation uh, about what the balance should be if the government wants data from outside the country, what hoops might it have to jump through other than just getting a warrant. Um, so that's on one side. Uh, and really the, the company's uh, goal there, most importantly, was a business goal, which is we need the rest of the world to trust us that we're not gonna just hand over data to the US whenever they want it. Um, then you have the other big issue, which is the foreign governments wanting US data. And this was you know, hitting a boiling point, especially the UK, but a lot of governments around the world getting super ticked off, um, not being able to investigate crimes, feeling like their own sovereignty was being violated, getting ready to like pass bad, bad encryption laws so that they could wiretap the stuff as it passed through their country or demanding that the data get stored there or locking executives up when they couldn't get what they wanted. That so, happened. Which happens. Um, and so you had the DOJ eager to make a deal here. You had the companies under enormous pressure to make a deal here. And then you had the privacy groups saying, well, slow down guys. Like let's, we understand there's a problem and we wanna work with y'all to try and figure out the right balance, but like, let's not rush into anything. Um, and so what happened was the DOJ and the companies made a deal and the companies said, the, the DOJ said, look, we will come to a compromise on this Microsoft Ireland thing. Um, if you come along with us on this deal for letting the foreign governments get data from you, um, that's maybe not as privacy protective as you want and certainly not as privacy protective as we want but it'll get the job done and get you out from under that pressure that they're putting you under. And that is how in March, we had this Cloud Act thing quickly attached to a spending bill before our movement really even had time to mobilize to try and stop it uh, and it got passed. And now I'll tell you what it does. Um, first, there's the Microsoft Ireland issue, the inside out issue and there, the DOJ didn't get its one sentence fix saying, you can just get stuff extraterritorially. Instead, they got a fix saying, you can get stuff extraterritorially, but the company has an ability to make you uh, go through a comedy hearing, comedy as in mutual respect, um, such that if the company is concerned that they're gonna be forced to violate Ireland, for example's law, or the other country's law in complying with the US request, they can go to a judge and have the judge weigh those considerations and determine whether it's okay or not. And sort of it gives them cover uh, if they're gonna, you know, if, if, they, if they feel like they're in a conflict of law situation. So the DOJ didn't get everything it wanted, it, it compromised, but in exchange, it got the companies to fully support their solution to the other side of the issue, which gets much more complicated. Um, the issue is how do we address this MLAT problem? And the way uh, they dealt with it is, we're gonna bypass it completely. And we're gonna create a structure where uh, the US can engage in an agreement with another country, like an MLAT, like in the sense of it's an agreement between these two countries about how they're gonna handle this stuff. But that agreement is gonna allow the country to, instead of routing its requests through the US government and meeting US standards, 
It's going to issue its own legal process under its own legal standards directly to the company. And the company is going to directly respond. We are going to completely bypass the MLAT process. Um, so the way this works is, and I'll, I'll lay out how it works and how it's problematic. First, you have to make the agreement. And the way this agreement is uh, done is it's negotiated by the DOJ and the State Department. And it is ultimately the DOJ's call whether to make the agreement with, uh, with the approval, with the buy-in of the State Department. Congress does not have to approve this agreement. Congress has the ability within 60 or 90 days, I forget which, to basically pass a law saying we think that agreement is a bad idea, but like they could have done that anyway. Um, so basically this happens without congressional or meaningful oversight and certainly not congressional approval. Um, and what DOJ and State Department are having to decide is, does this country meet these certain vaguely stated basic human rights norms? Um, which is good, we all like human rights, but they're very vague. And both the State Department and the DOJ, all of their incentives are towards making this deal. Because one, they wanna make this other government happy, State Department, and two, they wanna be able to make sure we can get their data, DOJ. Um, and so there's a concern that it's gonna be a heavily politicized process. We're not gonna really hold these countries to really strict standards. Um, and we're gonna have countries that have much lower standards than ours being able to get data from us. Um, and then how does that work? They make requests directly to the company without going through our government. The, there's no notice to the affected users. Um, the companies have immunity for complying. Um, and so there's a real risk of overreaching requests. The requests are supposed to be limited to or targeted at um, people from the uh, foreign country or in the foreign country? Mm -hmm. hmm? I mean, they're supposed to be. They're supposed they're to, be. They, to they're be. They're not allowed to intentionally target U.S. people. Um, but they can and target to, other and, foreign yeah, nations. And they're supposed to minimize any U.S. person data that they get. But um, this is the same system under which the NSA surveillance works, where we, we don't intentionally target and we minimize, but actually we're collecting an enormous amount of incidental information, and, and too bad for you. Um, and so, and I think the two biggest worries here is, well, three actually. So they're not held to probable cause. It's much more of a reasonableness standard. I don't think it's framed as necessary proportion directly in the statute. It's more about reasonable justification. And it doesn't require prior judicial review by the other country. It just requires some sort of independent evaluation of the request, either before or after the request. So it's much weaker than our legal standards. And then finally, not only can they request stored data, they can also do something that they've never been able to do before, which is demand wiretaps by the US companies. So through this law, we are now authorizing foreign governments under legal standards much weaker than our own to demand wiretaps from US companies, which is wholly novel and, and worrisome. Um, and so where we are now is the US and the UK are negotiating and trying to figure out how to implement this and trying to figure out whether they both satisfy the norms that they're setting uh, around what are the minimum standards. And the role of advocates right now is to say what's been laid out in this bill <laughs> is the floor and not the ceiling. And you, in the agreement that you make, can have higher standards than what's required in the bill, and you should. Um, and so that's what's happening right now. And really, the, the way the deal gets brokered between the US and the UK is gonna be really determinative of what the next deals look like. The UK has been the big driver of this process. They're the ones who've been the loudest and the most demanding. Um, and in many ways, they're the best candidate we're gonna get like they're pretty good um, compared to a lot of the world less so a lot of Europe but a lot like they're better than India they're better than Brazil um, you know they're better than a lot of the countries that are gonna want in on these deals um, so so yeah so that's that's where we are and so also just a few other things um, so you can't intentionally target a US person but you can incidentally get information about US people 
Uh, it has to be a serious crime, but that's not defined, and that includes terrorism, which gives a lot of wiggle room because also uh, most terrorism investigations are, are like preemptive. They're like they're trying to identify and stop potential terrorist activity rather than investigating a crime that's already happened. I think according um, to our partners in the in the UK, basically anything is a serious crime in the UK. Like petty theft is considered a serious crime in the UK. So not a meaningful. Yeah. So so that's that's where we are. And I'm sorry, that was a lot to just throw at you, but hopefully it was vaguely sensible. Thank, thank you, Professor. Uh, I, I, I've got a, a couple of questions for the panel, and then we'll, then we'll take questions from the audience. First, uh, Kevin or, or anybody else, can you unpack a little bit? You pointed out that a live wiretap is significantly more intrusive and invasive than stored communications. Can you unpack that a little bit for what the standard is for a live wiretap in the United States and why that's considered different? Sure. <laughs> so, so uh, I mean, and I think... Let's start with the basics. Um, in the US, if you want a stored communication, you get a warrant based on probable cause uh, you know, that particularly describes what you're after. Um, for a wiretap, uh, wiretaps are viewed as more invasive because they are ongoing. It's not a one-time invasion. It's an ongoing invasion of your privacy. Uh, and because, at least when they were first making the law around this, uh, it was much more invasive than getting your stored records. Now, when we're talking about stored records, we might be talking about like 20 years of all of your correspondence. So that's pretty invasive too. But I think that means we should just make those standards higher. But I digress. Um, for a wiretap um, in the US, it's like a super warrant. It's not only probable cause and particularity, but there's a strict time limit. It can only last for 30 days. Um, there's, uh, there's perhaps most important, an exhaustion requirement. You have to have tr basically tried everything else and had that fail in, in terms of trying to get the information you need uh, before you can get the wiretap. Um, it only applies to certain enumerated serious crimes, like there's a, basically a specific list of federal statutes you need to have allegedly violated uh, before they can wiretap you, again, because it's a serious invasion, so they want to make sure that it's a serious crime that they're investigating. And I think there's one or two things I'm forgetting right now because it's early in the morning. Um, but basically, uh, there are a lot more hoops to jump through if you want to... Uh, oh, and then there's, uh, there's a notice after the wiretap that you've been wiretapped. This is in criminal cases, not foreign intelligence cases, which are done in much more secrecy. But, but overall... Um, Wiretapping by law enforcement is the most heavily regulated law enforcement activity uh, in the U.S. Uh, so allowing a foreign government to do that. So allowing a foreign government stance. to do it is, is a little worrisome. Yeah. My next question, uh, these are, this is a bilateral agreement we're discussing with the U.K. What happens if a third party is involved? Let's say there's a crime that commits in the, committed in the U.K. and they are seeking emails about a German citizen in Germany, but the data is in the United States. Is there any protection at all for that German citizen? Nope. Darn. <laughs> and this, this is because I talked about that hyper-local crime that like happens in a village, law enforcement's there, the people are there, the information should be there, and if, you know, a pre-digital world would be. That is what this agreement was sold under. Like, if you go back and listen to the congressional hearings about this, the representative from the United Kingdom who got up and talked about it was like, we need to solve our local crimes, and we can't. And then right before the Cloud Act passed, and I'm talking weeks before it passed, the talking points all changed real fast. And it was, there's international crime, and we need to be able to investigate the international crime that's impacting the UK. And clearly they were starting to recognize that they weren't going to use it for the, like, the murder or the robbery that was happening in the UK. They wanted to be able to use it to target all of the people that they thought were um, potentially going to do something that would impact the UK. And if you think about the immigration situation in Europe right now and how governments are reacting to that, you can see this getting really invasive really fast. So it's great, wonderful, that they can intentionally target Americans. And I bet a lot of people in this room who are American are really happy with that, even though, as Kevin said, that probably isn't that meaningful, but they can intentionally target anybody else. And the fact that the information is in the United States has been a small lever of protection for these people because they had to go through this longer process, and now that protection is gone. 
So my next question, I, I understand that the, the DOJ can enter an agreement with a foreign country as long as the State Department says they meet some kind of human rights standard that we think they're a good country. Uh, those agreements last for five years. If the situation changes in those countries, is there any kind of review process where we can say, huh, Turkey is a NATO country and an ally and we, entered, we had an agreement with them, but they sure are locking up a lot of journalists and doing a lot of weird stuff. Maybe we should re-examine that agreement. Is there any review process? Is that a rhetorical question? Because honestly, I don't recall. Oh, it, it, no, the answer is no. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's I, I was looking for another simple no. <laughs> um, so what I was trying to get at is that we have some, uh, as privacy organizations, have really big concerns about this solution to a problem we recognize is a problem. But we didn't get to have any of those conversations. We didn't get to go through any of these process. We now have this weird law that might make agreements, and it might change the MLAT process, and it might make the world more complicated or it might solve all of law enforcement's problems and the world will be a better place. Uh, we'll find out. I don't think solving all of law enforcement's problems necessarily makes the world a better place. <laughs> uh, do, did you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah I just I want to say, I mean, I'm, I'm like I mentioned at the start, I'm from Canada, uh, what a lot of people would say is a, a good country with human rights protections. Um, and uh, the Canadian uh, Association of Chiefs of Police passed a resolution very recently uh, uh, urging our Prime Minister to sign an agreement with the U.S. under, under this to enable, uh, enable data sharing. Um, but um, we're actually just kind of coming out of a, a bit of a, a scandal around the G20 uh, when the G20 was in Canada. Uh, it, there were widespread uh, human rights violations, privacy violations by police. Um, and that's, you know, and courts have ruled that these were violations of the Char Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. There were uh, preemptive, um, there was preemptive surveillance and preemptive kind of disruption of activist groups uh, before uh, protests occurred and that kind of thing. And, and, and the idea of uh, law enforcement in Canada, which has repeatedly over the years and decades been reprimanded and, and shaped by the courts due to uh, a lack of, of respect of privacy and a lack of uh, respect of the Canadian Charter. The idea of those agencies having access to basically anything an American company does, which is everything on the internet essentially, right? Um, you know, everything Google, everything Dropbox, everything everywhere, um, without the protections that already exist is terrifying. Okay. Uh, before we go to audience questions, does anybody else on the panel want to add anything or think that we've missed in this discussion? Okay. Excellent. Is there any questions in the audience? So is there a way that you ask can... Uh, Got a microphone. So, is there a way the U.S. can veto, let's say, a request from like a country like Iran, and they want data on a certain indi individual, or is it just they've already entered the agreement, they already have free reign on this sort of information? Once they enter into an agreement, they the agreement doesn't even go to the U.S. government; it goes straight to the company. Now they have to enter into an agreement. So, hopefully, they wouldn't enter into an agreement with Iran. If they decided to do that, they no. But there is a process by which the company can say we don't think this actually meets the requirements of the of the law. Um, I think there's a concern about how incented they are to do that. Um, I also think it's highly unlikely we'd end up in a deal with Iran. Uh, in fact, I'm certain we will not yeah. end up Ar in a deal with Iran. Iran, no. But but a Amnesty International actually did a review, and under the language of human rights standards it, that they say it is, is so vague, it really does include countries that you might be surprised, such as I, I mentioned Turkey that has a really difficult political mm -hmm. situation. There's no reason to think that we wouldn't make deals with Poland, Hungary, India, uh, countries who have much, much lower standards. Yeah. But yeah, once the agreement is in place, it's in place for five years with no review process. Congress can proactively pass a law saying we do not approve of an agreement, but it requires an act of law by or an act by Congress with the majority of Congress actually voting on something, which is rare. Uh, so yeah, it's a little it's a little bit scary. Um, the companies 
can push back, but that's in a really weird position where companies are suddenly like, we have to push back against a foreign government under our own authority because we don't like what you're doing. Uh, I don't think many country, many companies are really going to say, yes, let's engage in an expensive legal battle because it's the right thing to do and let's piss off a foreign government. Yeah. It was their discomfort with doing that that drove this entire process. Like, they, they wanted a process by which they could say yes. Okay. Um, so I got another question. Uh, is there transitive properties to any of these agreements where another country can go through one country to request information through another? Actually, it explicitly doesn't allow that. Okay. Yeah. So in the same way that law enforcement can compel a DNA sample, can't we just like drop the companies out of the whole equation and law enforcement compel a password because the person has access to their information, right? The criminal well, potentially has access to their information. And if they have appropriate protections, for example, if there's a warrant for that password, and sure. uh, then they could, you know, say, okay, you only have, if you access this data, you can only pursue this specific crime out of that information, <laughs> that sort of thing. So, it, like, it seems more complicated than necessary. Help me understand why it's necessary. Criminals don't generally like to help law enforcement arrest themselves. Arrest them. I mean, that, that's basically it. Sure, if you're coming after my emails, maybe I have the password. Why would I give it to you? Especially if you're investigating serious crime that could put me in jail for 30 years. Or they may not have jurisdiction over that person in order to compel them. That person might be outside of the country. They also um, frequently, they don't want the person to know that they're getting the information. They want to, they're doing it proactively. They don't, they're not trying to alert, like they're not in the position to go and arrest the person, they're still conducting the preliminary investigation. So in the same way that, uh, you know, conducting a DNA sample would can't they, like, I, I'm not- So, well, so the DNA, the, the DNA example is interesting, that in, in the United States, there's a, a conflict among different district courts about whether or not you can be compelled at all to provide a password. The idea being it's a product of your own mind and you can't be compelled to testify against yourselves. Whereas if you use your fingerprint for a password, that is a biometric password that you don't have the same mm -hmm. constitutional protections under. That standard is exactly the opposite in the European Union. That you can't, you have protections for your biometrics, but not for your own mind. And that's where it gets complicated of the jurisdictional issue of what makes sense from our law enforcement perspective is the exact opposite there. And that's if you have all the people in the same area. The example of, let's say, you're investigating somebody, you know, sending uh, child pornography from Germany to the United Kingdom and the servers are in the United States. You wouldn't be able to go to that German citizen and say, hey, I just got off the plane, can you give me your password real quick and I'm gonna hop back over to London to continue investigating you? Mm -hmm. and there's a, there is a case out of, I believe out of the UK, of somebody who they were trying to compel the passwords to some of their hard drives and they just let themselves sit in jail for a really long time. They were like, you can tell me that I need to do this and you can issue warrants for it. You can't make me, you can't physically make me speak and but, they refuse to do it. But they're being punished, right? They're sitting in jail. Yeah, know. but they eventually got out. Most most of the time on those issues, eventually like they, they let the people go because what are you what are you are you gonna hold them indefinitely? You start to look at cruel and unusual punishment. A law just proposed uh, this month in Australia would uh, create a standard that's a based on the severity of the crime that police are investigating. If you refuse to provide a password, you can be put in jail for between two and ten years based on the severity of the crime. Based on the severity of a crime, ten years might be the best you're going to get. <laughs> so. Isn't this going to uh, only accelerate the uh, trend of end-to-end -end encryption so that even if they are forced to retain data, so what, it's all encrypted. They even, even they don't have access to it. Uh, Potentially? I, I, I'd see it already. I, to me, this is one of the best, you know, if I was an app, you know, person making a, say, like some social app, you know, already I'd see this like, you know, uh, what is, well, was it Snapchat down in Brazil that, um, no, not not Snapchat. Uh, uh, oh, WhatsApp. Yeah. Yeah. The 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 WhatsApp executive w was in prison briefly. Um, 
You know, I think if you gave me 90 minutes, I can start with pretty much any topic and end with why that's we should have more end-to-end -end encrypted uh, systems. Um, I, I agree this is one of many reasons that if you want security in your, your platforms, you want control over your platforms, it's one of many good reasons. If the question is, will this lead people to use end-to-end -end encrypted? Uh, potentially, but it'd be pretty far down the line. We don't, we don't actually have any of these agreements yet. It would take a while for it to really uh, show up in court cases that this is where data would come from, then even further for people to realize that this is happening, that your data is being shared around the world. Um, it, if, it's, if the question is, will this cause people to do things? I, I, I don't know, people are weird. <laughs> it's, it's complicated enough that, uh, to, to get Tech to this point, it took so. us an hour of discussion. Yeah, and it's really far downstream too. Right, for people to get there. Um, with foreign governments being able to talk directly to the um, company itself, it seems like there's a lot of caveat and tour for like the <laughs> for the individual. And I, I think I kind of agree in a bit with that particular question. But there are certain things that American citizens don't get to choose. Right, there are certain monopolies. For example, telecoms is one. I mean, you can choose different types of phone companies, but. Uh, if all of them are heavily persuaded, you know, to to follow along, um, I guess the question is, what what are the actual abilities of particular companies in these cases? So, so companies do have an the ability to push back. Um, it puts all of the onus on the company to decide to do that and to go forward with it. I think only the largest companies that have experience with international law are ever going to do that. Smaller companies are not going to. Uh, the, this uh, that's, we've seen a lot of smaller companies push back against surveillance. We saw Lavabit. We saw, um, I, it's too early for me to name several. It's, it's, a, matter, it's a matter of if they're going to have the incentive to do it, if they feel like it benefits them. Some companies do it without any publication at all. Yahoo pushed back against U.S. foreign intelligence requests in the FISA court, in the secret court. Nobody knew about it for years um, because it was all classified. So sometimes they do the right thing frequently, especially if they don't think they're going to get credit for doing the right thing. Um, they just go along with it because it's easier and they don't need to do it. But I don't know if the size, I don't necessarily know if the size of the company, it's more of the moral center of the company. Like, you should always choose who you do business with based on issues of trust and availability because sometimes trust can't be the only thing. I'm sure we could continue talking about this for many more minutes, uh, but we have one left. So is there a final question that we want to go out on? So uh, those of us who have uh, representatives that we can converse with, what would be the most constructive thing that we could do? I realize that the Cloud Act has already passed, but you know, we can maybe make it better. Yeah, so this is my personal opinion. I, I think the bill was rushed through so fast that it's going to force Congress to, to reconsider it. Um, there are just parts of it that are, that are just a little bit sloppy that weren't really thought out. And it was passed to approve this agreement, this classified agreement between the DOJ and the UK, uh, that they still haven't agreed because now that they have the authority, suddenly it's, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, so my theory or my expectation is that Congress is going to have to do something on this again. Uh, I'm not sure, given everything else going on in the world, that if you call your member of Congress, they're going to really remember it right now. It's more one of those things I would say keep on your radar for when Congress does, when it happens then that's when you will need to, to do, to make calls and send emails and tweets and all that. Uh, I, I fear that at the moment it would probably get lost in, in election. Um, that's not to say it's not worth calling your member of Congress. You should always call your member of Congress. Uh, but I think that there will be a good opportunity in the future for, uh, for us to rally support. I don't think the majority of people that actually vote on it read it when it went through. It's kind of the, the general understanding that I got previously. So I think it's it's certainly worth, you know, calling or doing whatever to to have a voice be heard. Congress does get to veto these agreements. They have 60 or 90 days to do that. Call your member of Congress and tell them you want to see every agreement published so you can read it and the public can read it before it gets um, finalized, and that if it doesn't meet certain standards, you expect them to veto these agreements. They ha still have a role to play here. The agreements are not in place 
and they can veto them when they come through. And if they're entering an agreement with the country and that agreement doesn't contain additional protections from what was in this crappy law, they should veto it. Uh, and if you don't already sign up for newsletters of organizations like Access Now, so if there is an action happening on it, you know when it's happening and, and when you can actually participate in it. So we're about out of time, so we'll say thank you. Thank you for sitting through this. I know it's complicated for Sunday morning. Really appreciate being here. If you did enjoy the discussion, feel free to donate to the literacy advocacy that we're accepting donations for. Thanks very much.